Okay, welcome. This is part two of the chapter three test review on part one. If you haven't seen it, we got through problems nine, and we're going to pick it up on problem number ten. This would be part of the second day's test. So we'll get a little zoom in here. And problem number ten, kind of a nice story problem. All right, the number of gallons of water in a tank T minutes after. So number of gallons of water, that's just an amount. That's just like if, if we were, that's like our position function, really. That's just like where's the squirrel located at on the wire. The number of gallons in the tank is given by, I guess that's quantity of T, is 300 times quantity 30 minus T squared. How fast is the water running out? That is our what function? be our velocity, right? So we want our velocity uh, function. So I'm going to go velocity at time t. Now, we're at a point in our book where our book is not, is not aware that we know chain rule right now. So to find that, we would have to FOIL 30 minus t and then distribute the 300. And you're welcome to do that if you're not comfortable, not completely comfortable with chain rule. But I'm going to chain rule this. My outside function is 300 something to the second. So the derivative of that is 600 something to the first. But we don't treat the baby yet. Treat the mother function, 300 something to the second. Then treat the baby. The baby function is the derivative of the baby function is derivative of. It's better is derivative of negative t, so that's just negative 1. Is that OK? Or we get our velocity is negative times negative is 600t minus 18,000. OK. So how fast is the, I'm going to call this question A because we've got more than one question. How fast is the water running out at the end of 10 minutes? So at the end of 10 minutes, that is our velocity at 10. So that is just 600 times 10 minus 18,000, or 6,000 minus 18,000, negative 12,000. And that would be in, are we dealing in gallons per minute? gallons per minute. But how fast is it running out? To me, it kind of implies speed rather than velocity. And it's really filling up at negative 12,000. Does that make sense? And the question is, how fast is it running out? So that would just be, we would make that positive 12,000. We've got to make some sense to the problem. Because they're basically asking, how fast is it becoming negative? We good there? All right. So this one, you're going to have to think in calculus at times. In algebra, if you were good at algebra and followed along and did everything, you see a problem and you've done it so many times, we're going to have to think. So let's make some sense out of this. What is the average rate at which the water flows out during the first 10 minutes? The average rate, this, our velocity equation gives us the instantaneous rate. I want the average rate. Much like if I said uh, over in five hours I drove 300 miles, what was my average rate? What did I need to know? I needed to take the 300 and divide it by five. Maybe I was only for an instant ever driving 60, but I averaged 60. So I don't really I, that wasn't about my that wasn't about my velocity at all. That was about how far I went divided by the time. Is that clear? So I need to know how far the water has changed. So I want to know what Q of 0 is compared to Q of 10. Q of 0 is 300 times 30 minus 0 times 30 squared or 300 times, sorry, nine, 30 times 30, 900, or 27 with four zeros. 
That's how much water is in the tank at time zero. How much water is in the time at the tank at time 10? Well, that would be 300 times 30 minus 10 times 20 squared, or 300 times 400, or 12 with four zeros, 120,000. So now I'm finding my you get it. I'm finding my displacement. So how much has the water changed is the difference of these. Is that okay? That's like my zero from spot zero to 300 miles away. How much has it changed? So what do I get here? 150,000. Is that right? Yep, 150,000. What was the average though in 10? So I get 15,000. What would my units be if this is average rate? Again, gallons per minute. Sorry, that's probably been off there the whole time. That make sense? Okay, then the graph below, which is not below anybody need one from one of these. Got them up here if you want to come up and grab one. The graph below is referring to well, this graph right here. And I'm going to zoom out on that. So we can get a little bit better picture. Here, pull this guy over. I don't need to see all of it. Boy, these are really, really common AP Calc type questions. I'll give you a graph and ask some questions. I don't know why we have this much space in here, but the graph below is V of T, and that is in meters per second. So yes, it is a velocity graph, and I think we're getting better at reading these things. Of a body moving along a cordon line, for me, you know me, that's always a squirrel on a wire. So when does the squirrel reverse direction? So here is our, the squirrel's velocity, and we say the graph's going up. But if my squirrel is on the wire here, the squirrel can only move right or left. Right here, as this graph is going up, where's the squirrel moving, right or left? Left, because the velocity is negative, correct? The velocity is negative, then the velocity is positive, then the velocity is negative, and then the velocity is negative again. The squirrel, when does the body reverse direction? So the squirrel is moving left, 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 and at this instant, stops and moves right, 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 fast right, slower right, slower right, stops, moves left. What's happening here? Is it stopped? Constant speed. It's just found. Hey, I'm just going to cruise it for a while at at two to the left, two feet per second to the left, or two meters per second to the left. Okay, it stops. But so when is it changing directions? It was going left. Now it's going to the right. It changed directions at t equals one second. It's going to the right. Now it's going to the left at three seconds. Anywhere else? No, nowhere else. That's it. Justify, and I guess I would just say that maybe at t equals 1, velocity changes from negative to positive. And then uh, we're out of room here. At t equals 3, changes from positive to negative. Something along that line. Okay. All right. When is the body moving at a constant speed? Well, when it's moving at a constant velocity, when is it moving at a constant velocity from 5 to 7? All right, and graph the acceleration and write as a piecewise function. All right, let's graph the acceleration first, then we'll worry about the piecewise function. 
Acceleration is the derivative of velocity, but in algebra speak, that means acceleration is the slope of the velocity. And we're dealing with straight lines here. What's the slope of the velocity on this run? One. So the acceleration is one on this run. I'll come back and we'll discuss whether we want open circles or dots. Then my acceleration appears to be, or my slope appears to be negative one. And it looks like straight line down to here. So it's constant acceleration of negative one. And then my acceleration appears to be, or my slope appears to be zero. From five, it appears like until seven. And then my slope from here to here, from seven to eight, appears to be up two over one, two. From seven to eight. And then my slope appears to be down one over one, negative one, from eight to nine. Is that okay? What do you think? Should one of these two get a dot? Here's the big hint. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. Can I take the derivative at a corner point? Nope. No corner points, no approaches infinities, no cusps. Can't take the derivative there, so it really acceleration doesn't it doesn't make any sense at a corner point. And, or think of it this way. What would the tangent line look like at that point? I, I don't know. It could be a lot of things. Okay. Then we want this guy as a piecewise function. Let's see if I have room for this. So as a piecewise function, I'm going to say f of x equals... Well, f of x equals a bunch of things. Some of the time, it equals 1. Maybe I should call that a of x even. Might, might even be better. They don't tell me, but so maybe a of x would be better. So a of x equals 1 some of the time. It equals negative 1 some of the time. It equals 0 some of the time. It equals 2 some of the time. And it equals, I could actually write this again. I could put negative 1 down again, but I'm not going to. When does it equal 1? When 0 is less than x. Maybe I should use t. That'd probably be better. A of t. When 0 is less than t is less than 2. Well, that's pretty easy, isn't it? Piecewise functions aren't so bad. When 2 is less than t is less than 5. And again, when 8 is less than t is less than 9, it's equal to 0. When 5 is less than t is less than 7, and not again, and it's equal to 2 from 7 to 8. When 7 is less than t is less than 8. That's okay. We can do that. So that would be one that it's possible. You understand, if we miss this part on the test, we're doomed on that part. So take your time on it. But let's say you missed a part on this. I will grade this part based on your graph. All right. Any questions on that page? Okay, so without us having without us having looked at looked at the trigonometry, we got some trigonometry here to to talk about. Uh, we didn't go through section three five, but we we have a sheet that has our derivative rules on it. So find the tangent line. For the tangent line, I need a point. For any line, I need a point, and I need a slope. Well, I want Here's my equation, y equals 2 sine of x plus 3. And we could graph this and take a look at it. Probably be a good idea. But I want to know, if I call this f of x, I want to know what f of pi is. My point 
is when x is pi something. So f of pi is 2 sine of pi plus 3. And here's my little sine thought bubble. Sine, plain old sine, looks like this from 0 to 2 pi. And at pi, there's pi on 2, there's pi right there. It is 0. So this is equal to 0 plus 3 or 3. The point I want, thank you. So here's my sine thought bubble. Missed that on the video. So my point is at pi 3. So right now, if I'm going to get the equation of the line, I'm thinking this is going to be y minus 3 equals something times x minus pi. I just need my slope. Well, my slope is going to be based on slope formula. So if I'm calling this f of x for slope, I want to find f prime of x. The derivative of this is 2 times the derivative of sine which we know now is cosine. 2 cosine of x. The derivative of 3 is still 0. So here's my little thought bubble for cosine. The graph of cosine looks like this from 0 to 2 pi. And there's pi. Right here, we're at negative 1. So I want f prime of pi. That is 2 times cosine of pi is negative 1. So there is an equation of my tangent line. No, it's not. That didn't, does that make sense? Yeah, that's my tangent line right there. Um, am I done? Can I be done? Should I solve for y? I'm just going to follow directions. Find the equation of the line tangent to the graph. I'm done. You want to solve for y? That's fine. I will have on a, if I had this problem on a key, I would have both of these answers as correct answers. Plus 2 pi plus 3. There's the y-intercept. But you could be done at that point right there. There, are, there were earlier problems that said write it in slope-intercept formula. We're going to be experts at reading directions. I take either one of those. Okay, find y double prime. How hard can this be? The second derivative of this guy. I mean, we've got, we've got a cheat sheet right in front of us. So y prime is derivative of cosecant. If they were all, only all as simple as sine, derivative of cosecant is the opposite of cosecant of x times cotangent of x. So, second derivative. It's tempting to take the derivative of this and the derivative of this and multiply them together. But this is a function of x times a function of x. This is product rule. It may also be tempting at this time to say, well, I'm really uncomfortable in the land of cosecants and cotangents. So maybe I should go to sines and cosines, and you can do that. We could think of this, if we wanted to, as negative 1 on sine times cosine on sine, and then we get cosine on negative, or negative cosine on sine squared, and now we got a quotient rule. That's OK, too. You can do that. But I'm telling you, cosecants and cotangents just as good as sines and cosines. Why? Because they live together in a Pythagorean identity. That's why we go to sines and cosines. They're together in a Pythagorean identity. These are two. If this was cosecants and tangents, I might go to sines and cosines. OK, so second derivative. I'm going to leave the first the same. And I'm going to take the derivative of the second. Well, cotangents derivative is negative cosecant squared. Is that right? You guys are looking at it. Negative cosecant squared of x plus. I'm going to take the derivative of negative cosecant. That is negative 
but the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant x cotangent. This is the derivative right here of negative cosecant times plain old cotangent. Is that all right? So these double negatives clean themselves up. So at this stage, I'm at, well, that's kind of good. Negative times negative positive cosecant cubed x. And then I've got plus cosecant x times cotangent squared x. And I'm pretty happy at that point. However, there is a Pythagorean identity. And I'm going to talk about that, uh, not on the video, but I'm going to talk about that uh, with you guys in just a bit here. There is a Pythagorean um, relationship that says cotangent squared of x plus 1 equals cosecant squared of x. So I might be tempted just to put everything in terms of cosecants. I'm not saying you have to do that. We might be content with this, but let's take a look. Cosecant cubed of x plus cosecant of x times cotangent squared of x could be replaced by 1 minus, no, 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 cosecant, excuse me, cosecant squared of x minus 1. So does that help any? Let's see, I get cosecant cubed plus another cosecant cubed. I don't know, maybe we could make an argument that's simplified compared to that. Maybe we could factor out a cosecant and try to manip manipulate things further. Now, I believe you're going to have time on the test. If it were me, when this problem was done, follow this. This is what I would do. I would graph this. We're going to graph that probably by entering it as 1 on sine. So I'm going to have y1 equals 1 on sine of x. I'm going to have y2 equals and derive y1. And then I'm going to have y3 equals n derive y2. And then I'm going to graph this one. And I'm going to graph this. I'm going to enter my answer and see if they overlap. I'm going to turn these guys off, graph this one, and see is it the same graph as that. See what I'm saying? Second derivative, so we make sure we don't do any have any trig issues. And if if they they don't match and you can't find your mis mistake, give me a note that says I believe this is wrong based on calculator investigation or something like that, and maybe I'll commend you for that with a point or something if you have time to do it. All right. Okay. So if I've got a function cosine of x. So this is like this is like derivative 0 is cosine of x. Derivative 1 of cosine of x is negative sine of x. What's derivative 2? It's just kind of scratch work here. Take the derivative of this guy. All right, because derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative 3, not derivative 3. It's kind of bad notation, but this is just scratch work. What's the derivative of the opposite of cosine? The opposite of the opposite of sine. Whoops. Derivative 4. Derivative of sine gets me back to cosine, doesn't it? Derivative 5. Back to negative sine. I'm not going to do this much longer. I'm certainly not going all the way up to 499. Derivative 6 back to negative cosine. Derivative 7 back to sine of x, dot, 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 dot. This is called, this is a problem that the mathematical term starts with an M. Anybody know what it is? MO? Modulo? How many of you heard of mo computer science people haven't heard of modulo? Some of you? Clock. We live on we live on modulo twelve. Thirteen is equal to one. Right? Thirteen o'clock is one. Days of the week we're on modulo seven. The eighth day of the week or the ninth day of the week we're back to Tuesday or something like that. All right. This is modulo four. 
Every multiple of 4 gets us back to cosine. What's a modulo, what's a modulo of 4, or what is a multiple of 4 near 499? D500 is a multiple of 4, right? That would get us back to cosine of x. So D499 would be right here, sine of x. Is that OK? I would hate this problem if this said, the 499th derivative with respect of cosecant of x. <laughs> that, if you see what happened in the second derivative, that would stink. But cosine, sine, they're just going to keep rotating back through each other. Good there? All right, and 15. Find dy dx. It says dy dx. I'm going to find dy dx. I'm not going to find y prime when it tells me to find dy dx. DY DX equals, um, can I simplify things? I don't think there's much to do here. I'm going to low all of it. D high minus high sine of x. D low, derivative of 1 is still 0. Derivative of cosine is negative sine over the square of the thing below. All right, what good happens here? I get a cosine of x when I distribute, plus a cosine squared of x here, minus minus plus a sine squared of x on 1 plus cosine x squared. That should be screaming at us. Sine squared plus cosine squared, 1. So this is cosine of x plus 1 on 1 plus cosine of x squared. I can cancel a factor. I got a factor of 1 plus cosine, and I got two factors of 1 plus cosine. I end up with 1 on 1 plus cosine of x. I would expect us to get to that point on that problem. Might, this, might we be able to manipulate this a lot of ways? Yeah, we might be able to manip manipulate this a lot of ways. You might go to sines and cosines and maybe it sometimes simplifies in the eye of the beholder, but boy, I would hope that would have just been a flashing red light. You'd say, oh yeah, that's a 1. I would expect us to get to here. So dy dx, doesn't hurt to write it again, is that guy. And good luck on that. I actually think, because I don't think it will hurt to have it on the video, I'm going to go back and talk about those uh, Pythagorean relations. I have them written on the sideboard. But one thing on... Uh, I asked last hour after I went through this, raise your hand if you've never seen this before. And two of my students that were in my class last year said they've never seen it. So I yelled at them. So when I ask who hasn't seen this, if you were in my class last year, just pretend that you remember it. Um, in trigonometry, I call this theta. I'm going to call this x, y, and r as we're rotating around rather than opposites, adjacents, and hypotenuses. Um, one thing we know from this for sure, and these are called Pythagorean identities, so what, why are they called Pythagorean identities? Well, let's start with x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Trig functions are just ratios of side lengths. There's six possibilities. x on y, x on r, y on x, y on r, r on y, r on x. There's six trig functions, all the possibilities. So let's make some ratios of side lengths. I'm going to divide both sides by r squared. x on r, adjacent on hypotenuse, is what? So this is cosine squared of theta plus y on r, opposite on hypotenuse. Sine squared of theta, r squared on r squared, 1. Oh, that's cool. All right, how about if we do this? x squared plus y squared equals r squared. I just arbitrarily decided to divide by r squared. Why don't I divide by x squared? I think you see where this is going? x squared on x squared, 1, plus y on x, opposite on adjacent. Right? r on x. Well, x on r, adjacent on hypotenuse, is cosine. Reciprocal of cosine, we remember, is secant. 
So this is secant squared of theta. How about x squared plus y squared equals r squared, and I divide by y squared. x on y, well, y on x, or opposite on adjacent, is tangent, reciprocal of tangent, cotangent, squared plus 1. r on y, well, y on r, or opposite on hypotenuse, sine, reciprocal of sine, I have these memorized. Never intentionally did I memorize these, but you teach the same class for 19 years, three periods a day, and you spend a few weeks on that. I do have these memorized, and it's probably nice to have them memorized, but that's the only one I really ever intended on memorizing because we worked in sine and cosine so long, but I had an avenue to get there. Memorization fails in the long run until you just have it so soaked in. How many of you remembered, honestly remembered, those two identities? Yeah, a hand or two. But how many of you feel like, hey, if I forgot them, I can get there now? All right. Now, how about hands if you haven't seen this, if you haven't seen that before? Okay, because I think Mr. Hart did it as well. You, hadn't, you don't, don't recall seeing it. Helpful? Yeah. You know, if we forget them, if we memorize them, great. And there are some similarities here. But anyway, that, that is such a huge emphasis of mine, particularly teaching honors pre-calculus, of all the things that we don't have to memorize. Okay, hope that's helpful. Uh, good luck on the test.